Shalom Chavarim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And this broadcast today, friends, will no doubt air on uh, World Harvest Television Network on DirecTV Channel 367, as well as Israeli News Live. It is probably the most profound insight that I have ever gotten in my life. And I think it is vital that I share this. And I'm asking you, share this video everywhere you possibly can because the information I'm about to share with you is something unlike anything I think that has ever been brought out before. We're going to be looking at the Messiah hidden in the story of Moses. Now, no doubt there's been others maybe that have talked about that. And I, and I have myself taught on Moses as a type of Mashiach, a type of the Messiah in times past. But something happened to me yesterday. I, I tend to like to put on Hebrew music uh, and, and listen to it. And as I do uh, when I'm speaking about not just any type of Hebrew music, but specifically about certain aspects that happen, or I'll play uh, the Bible in Hebrew and listen to it and just meditate. And as I do, the God begins to open up my understanding in many areas that are that are just phenomenal. Well, last night that happened once again, and what I'm about to share with you has just totally blown me away. Uh, and it is going back to the birth of Moses, uh, an incredible thing that was sitting there, hidden there, that not only uh, Messiah is hidden in this story, but it reveals who the Messiah is. So for my Jewish brothers and sisters that are going to be listening to this, if you are watching it on Israeli News Live and you're there normally for the news broadcast, I'm telling you, take the time, listen to what you're about to hear. It's going to be something that will shock you, no doubt, and also make you realize God hides things in the simplest places you could ever imagine. So without any further uh, ado on this intro part here, let's get right into the story. Let's go right to the book of Exodus, Shemot in Hebrew, Shemot Aleph, or uh, the Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 1 there. And let's begin starting with verse 6. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. There, there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph, and he said unto this people. Uh, what did he say unto them? Well, he said, Israel are, there, Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal wisely with them. Let's they multiply, and it come to pass that when there befalleth us any war, they also join themselves unto our enemies, and fight against us and get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramesses. Uh, and of course, it goes on into verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad, and they were a, a, a dread because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field and in all their service wherein they made them serve with rigor. Now, I'm, we're just getting into this. We're going to be going right into the fact that Moses is born, etc. But I want to kind of set the stage of what's happening because the insight, the revelation that, that the Lord has shown me is phenomenal. Uh, but starting off with this right here, there rose up a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. Now, Moses hadn't necessarily been born as of yet when you look at this story. This is actually before he's born. And there rises up a Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. Now, Joseph has died. All of his brothers have died off. Now it's the children. And of course, uh, you know, as that time moves forward, now they're turning against them. And it's interesting because when it says they did not know Joseph, yet they lived among them. Joseph was a savior of Egypt, but yet they didn't know him. Well, you know, what's odd about this is that if you look, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really ask my Jewish brothers and sisters, I, I, I'm begging you, don't turn this off and go somewhere else. If you really want to know who your Mashiach is, 
You've got to listen and you need to listen with an open heart and not just turn it off because it's important for you to hear what I'm about to say to you. I'm speaking to you as your brother, as a Hebrew with you, both parents, Hebrew descent, both my parents, listen to what I'm telling you. All right. So when Pharaoh, when the Pharaoh that knew Joseph, believed Joseph, when he died, when, when, the, when they all died off and Joseph and his brothers died off, then there raises up another Pharaoh and he doesn't know Joseph. All right. Moses is not quite yet born, about to be born, but we have no idea the time space that had transpired when the new Pharaoh was in before Moses is actually born. But they begin to conspire on what they're going to do to, to try to thin out the children of Israel, to, to, to lower their numbers because they feel that they are a threat. Well, oddly enough, just before the coming of Yeshua, or Jesus as the Greek calls him, we also had a very interesting thing that happened in Israel. Now, again, mind you, like Moses, because remember, Moses said, the Lord thy God will raise up unto you from among your brethren a prophet likened unto me. Now, I'm paraphrasing that, right? But he's going to raise up from among your brethren a prophet likened unto me. I think that means that there should be a whole lot about Moses' life that is like that of Yeshua. So before Moses is even born, a Pharaoh rises up that doesn't know Joseph, doesn't know uh, Isaac, doesn't know Abraham, doesn't know the commands of God that they have given them or that has been living on. Even the Egyptians were beginning to live under those types of of, of knowledge of what truth really is. Well, before Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, come on the scene, the same thing happened inside of Israel. Now, we could go back and say, well, they were under the Greek rule. Well, I'm talking about after the Maccabee brothers come and, and, and crush the Greek uh, rule in the country there, this is when it began to rise up a time where there was a Pharaoh or a leader in Israel in this case. Now, mind you, I realize King David and, and King Solomon and, and the kings of Israel that fr come from David's loins were not Pharaohs of Egypt. But in the regards of a type of leadership, they were like the types of Joseph and Joseph's children, Ephraim and Manasseh, and all of these had already died off, okay? So they were representing Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, okay? Representing Israel in that regard there. Well, then there rises up on the throne, because remember, Joseph was on the throne in Egypt, right? There rises up on the throne in Israel a king that is not from the Davidic line. There rises up a priesthood through the Maccabees that is not heir to the priestly line. Now, there is argument that they were of the Levitical priest line or the Kohanim, but they were not in direct lineage for the priest to be the priest. All right, let me share some of that with you here so you understand that. This here is on the Jewish learning, the Hasmonean dynasty. Let's just read a little bit of this, get, an idea, get a picture of this. In 142 BC, Simon, the last survivor of the Maccabee brothers, was recognized as high priest and, and political leader by his own people. He severed bonds of allegiance to the Syrian rulers, got the Greek garrison out of Jerusalem, and began to mint his own coins, the first ever by a Jewish state. He was succeeded by his son, John uh, Hyrcanus, who established the Hasmonean dynasty, uh, which is a term that was introduced in the Talmud, may have been Matthias' family name from his grandfather, Simon Hamanoi, uh, or, or a designation meaning prince or possibly related to the position of priesthood. Now, taking control of the kingship violated the people's trust because it transgressed Torah. The Bible stipulates in Genesis 49.10 that the kingship should always rest in the tribe of Yehuda. That is the tribe of Judah, Jacob's son. As it did once David's line was established, it was to be separated from the priesthood which comes out of the tribe of Levi from Aaron, from Aaron's descendants, Numbers 3, 6 through 9, to balance the secular 
and the spiritual. All right. Now, I want to continue on with this. Hasmoneans, though, Kohanim of the tribe of Levi, were not in the line of the priesthood or for the political leadership which they usurped. Okay, now the author gives his own interpretation of events here, but I want you to hear, hear this in part at least. What began in glory ended in ignominy. Uh, ignominy. The nine Hasmonean rulers to be recognized by the Roman Senate engaged in the same political intrigues, self-aggrandizement, uh, and bloodshed as the previous regime. When two brothers who were not eligible claimed the kingship, they called on representatives of Rome to arbitrate. Foolishly repeating the mistake of the Hellenized Jews, they, uh, the, the contending brothers opened the door of the Roman conquest, <clears throat> which ended their rule when Herod killed the last of them after just 103 years and ended Jewish sovereignty in Israel for almost 2,000 years. The Hasmoneans' early triumph were soon shadowed by their corruption due to the unpopularity of its founder. Uh, Hanukkah itself came to be largely ignored within a few decades after its origins then when Rome's crushing power began to be felt in Palestine. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Just like the Pharaoh that rises up that doesn't know Joseph. All right, It's not to say that the Pharaoh was not related or in line of the Pharaohs before, and in fact would probably be more in line with that of uh, this, in the case here, where you have a family that supposedly is descendants of, of the Levitical uh, family, but not in line. It was Zadok that was the true last Aaronic uh, uh, Levite. And of course, they have, they're forced out. They go down to Qumran. They begin their community down there uh, from what we can understand in this. But this was the most corrupt. The Maccabees, everybody wants to bring them out like they're some great guys because they liberated the temple. That was the great thing they did. But to assert the traditions that God had laid in through Moses and the laws, the commands of God, and take the kingship from David's lineage, and to take and put themselves in the position of a priest when they were not in line for that was totally wrong. They did not know Joseph. And because of this, when Yeshua came, they did not know their Messiah. Sound familiar with Moses' story as well? Sure it does. All right. Now, I want to show you just how corrupt they were. All right. This is from the Times of Israel. And this is only just three of them. There is a whole list of the, in fact, uh, in the Times of Israel, in this particular article here, they give you the entire list of, of all, all of the high priests that were ever over Israel. But even before the Maccabees come in there and corrupted it as well, it was already being corrupted before the Maccabees come in, but the Maccabees had the opportune time to restore it back to the way that God intended this to be. But they didn't do it. So, you have 67th high priest, Elias ben Shimon Kathrias, son of Shimon Kathrias ben Bothias, and high priest for a year. He was appointed by King Agrippa. What has King Agrippa got? A Roman king, what has King Agrippa got to do with appointing the high priest over Israel? That sounds a lot like what's going on in the country today now. You remember how I told you the founding of Israel when Israel became a nation, Ben-Gurion and, and uh, Moshe Sharit, the first two prime ministers of Israel, very much backers of the Vatican, Rome. And when Rome and Pope Pius XII wanted to bring about in 1947, Jerusalem being an international city that would be governed by the U, or there would be the UN would protect that city there. And of course, the West Bank was made as a buffer zone to keep the Israelis or the Jews, the Hebrews, out of that area. Moshe uh, Sharit and Ben Gurion both went along with it so much that they were willing to kill those Jews that had brought in all the military to be able to liberate Jerusalem. Now, I don't say this in speaking against the Palestinian people that have been living in this land for, for, for centuries as well. You know, we should have done it the way it was being done back in 1858 when the Ottoman Empire opened up the purchase of the land by 
Jewish descendants or Hebrew descending people were allowed to come back into the land and purchase land because they were looking for a way to raise taxes, but they came the way Abraham did. Remember, Abraham would not even allow the land to be given to him. I know some are going to argue, well, God told Moses go there and Joshua, and they went in there and said, take the land. He was dealing with what? He was dealing with with some of the Nephilim. He was dealing with the land that had been taken over by demonic beings through Nephilim, through the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hittite, the Hivite. And we know they were giants. And these giants are what? They were also offspring from before the flood. And how they got back, totally different story. Don't have the time to go into that today there. But that's what he was dealing with. That's why they took and killed off the inhabitants of the land. But we're not dealing with giants in the land. Do the Palestinians look like giants to you? No. Jeez, totally different. Joseph ben Kemidas, uh, all right, probably the son of Shimon ben uh, uh, Kemhit, and the high priest for two years. He was appointed by the deposed Herod uh, of Calicus, who replaced him with Hanaya ben uh, Nibodias, which, of course, he was 12 years, and he was appointed by Herod uh, Calicus and deposed by King Agrippa II of Judea. How do these kings get involved in this? I mean, it's unbelievable, right? Well, let me tell you something. There's an amazing book, though. Amazing book. The Jews don't want it as part of their canon, and, uh, and neither, do, neither has it been accepted as far as in Christian works, but yet it's from the actual 5th century, the oldest document we have. It is supposed to be written by Moses. I can't say if it is or is not, but I will tell you one thing. Uh, and this part right here is not so much a prophecy. If you know, It would be a prophecy if we know for a fact Moses wrote it. But I have no way to authenticate that Moses wrote the Assumption of Moses. Uh, but there are clearly more prophetic things in this book, though, that have been clearly identifying events that are happening in modern times. But in this case here, and this is probably one of the reasons why the Jews don't want it in there, is on this next statement here, because Moses clearly identifies the Maccabean dynasty usurping the authority that God laid out through Moses. Ver chapter 6, there, Then there shall be raised up unto them kings bearing rule, and they shall call themselves priests of the Most High God. The only time in history of Israel that the king also takes the priest's place was through the Maccabee brothers. That's exactly right. Claim to be the king and the high priest. They shall assuredly work iniquity in the Holy of Holies. And an insolent king shall succeed them who will not be of the race of the priests, a man bold and shameless. And he shall judge them as they shall deserve. And he shall cut off their chief men with the sword and shall destroy them in secret places so that no one may know where their bodies are. He shall slay the old and the young and he shall not spare. Then the fear of him shall be bitter unto them and their land and, they, and he shall execute judgments on them as the Egyptians executed upon them. During thirty or four years, and he shall punish them, and shall beget children. Succeeding him shall rule for shorter periods, and to their parts, cohorts, and powerful king of the west shall come, and shall conquer them, and shall take them captive, and burn part of their temple with fire, and shall crucify some around their colony. Sound familiar? Yeah, Yeshua was crucified. And the temple was burnt. That king from the west. Well, if you look at Rome on the map from Israel or Jerusalem, it is definitely more west than northwest. It's north of Israel, but west of Israel. So yeah, Titus, the Roman general. When they had had enough. All right, now let's continue on though. Now we're going to back up. We've got to go back to Exodus. We've got to look into this because this is an incredible revelation. Exodus chapter 1. Now we go to verse 15. And the king of Egypt spoke, of the Hebrew mid, uh, spoke to the Hebrew midwives of whom the name of one was Shephara and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when, do you, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, you shall look upon the birth stool. If it be a son, then shall you kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall, he, she, she, shall, she, shall she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king, as the king of Egypt 
commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and saved the men children of life? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered, ere the midwives come to them. All right, going on to verse 20. And God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all the people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Now, before we go on to chapter 2, got to share this with you. I thought it was incredible. When I read, I read this so many times, and God made them houses, you know, and we think that that is here on the earth. I don't believe it was on the earth. I believe He made it for them in heaven. Never thought about it like that before. But I think that's what happened. And notice, so he also he cast all the children into the river. Now, on this message here, I won't have time to go into the where Moses turns the water to blood, etc. But the turning the water to blood had a lot to do because he threw those children in the river. And let me tell you something, where they were, just like in the days of Yeshua, what was it? There was an order by Herod. He hated the fact that this Yeshua had been born, and he was trying to find him. And so when the wise men came down and everything, what did he do? When they wouldn't tell him where he was, he ordered that all the children from two years old and down be destroyed. No wonder why. Your waters are going to turn to blood again today. Not only did that happen, not only was, was Egypt trying to kill all the little boys because they wanted to stop and put a stop. Now see, Satan knew there was a deliverer coming. Pharaoh didn't, but, but, but Satan did know. And that's why he was trying to kill that anointed child, that Moses. He wanted to get that child. Same with Yeshua. Same with the two witnesses. They have consulted, according to Psalm 83, against thy hidden ones. That's your two witnesses. And what have they done? They have developed vaccines. Uh, they have developed abortion and everything else. What is it? Satan trying to find that anointed child, that, those two boys that are born in this earth today that will be anointed with the spirit of the two witnesses to try to kill them before they could actually do anything. I wonder why they're going to turn the water to blood. All right. Now we're getting into the good part. Let's go on to chapter 2. Sorry I'm reading all, all, every, every bit of this, but there's a reason behind it, okay? So just bear with me. And there went out a man of the house of Levi, and took a wife, a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrush and dopped it with slime and with pitch. And she put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river. All right, flags. Now, the, the, those flags, by the way, are reeds. Okay, it's the same word, I believe. Let me just look real quick just to make sure for you. Yes, it is. It's the same word as suf. Found right here on the bottom. You may not be able to see it because it kind of cuts off the Hebrew. I was kind of doing this quickly here. Besuf in the reeds. All right, that's where that's where she was being. That's where she hid him at. And of course, when she put that slime on there, that slime, by the way, friends, is from a from a Hebraic word here, uh, taber. I'm I'm sorry, I got the wrong word. Let me let me get right where I can find it here. She took him to the ark of the bulrush and daubed it with slime. Here it is. I'm sorry. Be uh, excuse me, chamar uh, is the slime, and that's actually a word that we use in modern Hebrew for the word clay. But it, it can be liquefied; it can be made very, very soft. And uh, you know, there's some that believe that the way, because when it speaks about the pitch, it's kind of like uh, they think it's like more like a like a like an asphalt that we would say today. I don't think it was that they didn't have asphalt back then, but it was a way that they were able to take that clay and form it around that ark. And of course, those reeds, that bulrush that was being used right there, is a very porous type of, of material there. And that was what was being done. They were using that. But here's what's amazing. There is something about the fact of the ark that he's put in, the way it's made, and how it represents something about Yeshua. And we're totally missing this. And the very reeds that, they're, that he has placed around. They, you know, some people put it like, oh, he put him in a basket and he floats down the Nile River and then she finds him and it lands up in the reeds. No, it's not what it says in the Word. God said he, she placed him in that ark and placed that basket right there in the reeds themselves. 
All right. Then Pharaoh's daughter comes out and finds it. We're going to go into that. Then we'll go back. We're going to back, backtrack in just a minute. Therein. All right. Continue on in verse 3 here, chapter 2. And laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And she saw the ark among the flags and sent her handmaid to fetch it. Going on to verse 6. And she opened it and saw even the child. And behold, a boy that wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maiden went and called the child's mother. Mm. Wow. Remember the scripture over in the book of Acts? Because right, notice now, she's now going to be reared up in Pharaoh's house. The very man that doesn't know Joseph is now raising in his own house as a son, one of the Hebrew children. Yeshua, who grew up in a... In a Modern day Israel 2,000 years ago, when he was growing up, he was growing up in a country that had a false king on the throne and also had a false priesthood. But yet, according to many of the apocrypha writings, he became a rabbi and was recognized by the rabbinical community as a rabbi, as a teacher. Now, Acts chapter 7, verse 22, uh, Paul writes in there that, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So like Yeshua, he grew up, I mean, he was truly up though among the reeds, right? What do the reeds represent? Do you realize what the reeds represent? Let me just... Okay, Numbers chapter 17. All right, now just for a note, I put a note on here if you're, if you're doing King James Version or, or NIV or any other type of uh, version of the Bible other than a Hebrew Bible, that would actually be verses 2 and 3 in chapter 17. A little different there. But anyway, it says here, Speak unto the children of Israel and take of them rods, one of each of the father's house, of all the princes according to their father's house. Twelve rods, thou shalt write every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For there shall be one rod of the head of their excuse me, for the head of their father's houses. So in other words here, now the word reed and rod is two different words, all right? But the, the point is, is they both are a staff or a stick. They represent what? In the case of the rods that were placed in the ark there, it was an almond rod that was used by Aaron. And of course, it budded and, and, and blossomed and bore almonds that night that it was in the ark. But what is it? That staff, that rod, like you see in this picture of the reeds right here, represent the tribes of Israel. It represents the lineage, as it says in inside the uh, in Micah chapter 7 that Moses was to or not in the case of Moses but that prophet was to instruct them by what the rod of his lineage it represents DNA it represents ancestry so when Moses was placed in a basket and put in the uh, amongst the reeds and by the way remember the children of Israel were crossing what Yam Suf, a sea of reeds. And yet over there on the Gulf of Aqaba, there are no reeds. What does it, what is it? They themselves are the sea of reeds, their lineage, their family. And so when Moses was placed in that basket and put amongst the reeds, it was like the 12 rods that were placed in the ark. It represented the tribes of Israel. It represented that, that among the tribes, the Messiah, the future Messiah, Moses was only a type of the coming of the Messiah, that he would be in the womb of his mother Mary and would be placed in amongst the reeds themselves. Oh, wow, that was something we didn't think about, was it? All right, let's take a look at this. In Genesis chapter 2, what does it say here? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, that was the dust of the earth, right? And what did it say over here in Exodus 2? And when she could no longer hide him, she took him an ark, a bulrush, and daubed it with slime. That word slime right there, uh, chamea, 
is actually the word for clay. God made man from the earth, the dust of the earth. Okay, Adama. We just use the word Adama over here. But over here is Bechamea, which is the clay, a softened clay, like God formed man from the dust of the ground. All right? And what is it when God, when God had uh, uh, Moses' mother, hide him in that basket there what was she doing she was taking that basket like the womb of a woman and when that slime and that pitch was put around that basket that was showing that the messiah that anointed child in this case was moses but it was showing that in the future in the womb of a clay of a human being in this case mary that the anointed one would be placed in a basket and it would be what in the midst of, her, of their people and that's exactly what we see in that picture right there it's like the woman that basket they just make it look like a little old wicker basket but that was a basket that looked like a clay basket almost because it had been daubed together with all that clay and it looked like just it was just as if it was a womb of a woman there and that clay represented mankind that Moses was placed in that womb and what happened when his when Pharaoh's daughter saw it is amongst the reeds. Why? Because you, Yeshua was born amongst the children of Israel. And the very ones that had rejected him, that rejected Moses' people, were now taking him in and adopting him as their own son. Yeshua, when he was born, he also became a not a high priest per se, but he was the high priest in reality, but he became a rabbi among them, among a corrupt priesthood. And what did God do with Moses? Yeah, Moses had to flee. Well, so did Yeshua. He had to flee as well. His father was warned by an angel, take the child and go into Egypt and hide there. All right? And while he was hiding there as a type of Moses, Moses went into what? Pharaoh's house and what was hidden. They couldn't kill him. And Jesus, where was he hidden? In Egypt. Oh my gosh. When the time come, Moses come out, he was ready to deliver his people. Now he slew an Egyptian. Why? He wasn't the Mashiach. He wasn't that anointed one that God called for the job. But see, what did he do? God had to send him off. He went to the backside of the desert and he had to live there for, for, for quite a few years. Another 40 years away, waiting for that time. But when Moses come down, what does he do? Moses delivers the children of Israel with a stick in his hand. How did Christ re uh, redeem Israel? On a cross, on a stick. The two sticks that were crossed together, that were tied together like the stick of Ephraim and, uh, 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 and Judah there. My gosh. I mean, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. You know, that that's what the ark represented. It represented that the Messiah, the anointed one of Israel, would come in the womb of a woman. Because why? It was daubed with clay in the reeds amongst his own people. And like it was in the case when Joseph, when it says there at the beginning there, there rose up a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, just so happened in the time before Jesus was born, there rose up a priesthood that didn't know Moses. Oh, they may have claimed to believe Moses, but if you believe Moses, you would keep his word. That's what Yeshua says too. If you believe me, then keep my word. Be ye hearers, be ye doers, not just hearers, but doers. And they totally rebelled against Moses' command. And here Yeshua, living in a day with a false priesthood, a false kingship. No wonder why we had Ahab that married Jezebel and brought idolatry from Rome back into Israel. It's the same thing. Now Pharaoh rose up on the throne, had totally forgot that Joseph was a deliverer for their people. And my Jewish brothers and sisters, you are looking for a Mashiach to come. When you can find a Mashiach that fulfills the Word of God in all the types and shadows the way that Yeshua did, you tell me who He is. I've already found Him. 
Kind of like Philip said to Nathaniel, come see a man. We have found the Messiah. Come see a man that told me everything. Every, everything. Maybe we got that kind of twisted up in the words there, but you understand what I'm saying. And he said, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? When he said Jesus of Nazareth, he said, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? He just told him to come on and see. Maybe this is what we need to do. We need to take a closer look at who Yeshua really was. Not who the churches say He is, and I'm not here against my Christian friends. But let's look to the Word of God. Because unfortunately, even in the day we're living in now, it's a false priesthood. Rome is a false priesthood today. And it's all being set up all over again, just as it was 2,000 years ago when the Maccabee brothers usurped, uh, usurped the priesthood and usurped the, uh, the, the leadership of Israel, we've got the same problem today. Rome has done it. An, a, 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 an Edomite lineage has come and taken over Rome and called themselves the priest. They no more have a right to be there than... The Maccabees did. Maccabees actually probably had more of a right to be there, but they were still being controlled by Rome nonetheless. Jeez. Friends, more could be said there. So much more could be said, but I'll stop for now. I trust this blesses you as much as it did me. And there's much more that I could say, and I just have not said it. But if it is a blessing to you, and you would like to support the work we do here, we do need your support. We need your help in, in bringing these broadcasts out. There's a lot that's got to be done. We need to go back to Europe here in November, meeting with the parliament there to try to bring more exposure to truth. We need to stay fighting that good fight. And your support of this ministry makes that happen. If you're having trouble going on our website on, Isra on IsraeliNewsLive.org and donating there, you can also mail that to us as well. You can do it to Prague Czech Republic, just like you see at the end of the video here. You can, you can give there as well. Uh, I'll be back there soon, but uh, we've got family there that sends everything that's sent to us here. Uh, if you haven't heard from us, it's been delayed. Please forgive me. We will. We are behind. There's so many things we're having to try to take care of here while we're in the United States here. Uh, we'll be gone for a short period of time to Europe, coming back again in December. Uh, and then again, we have to return back uh, later in the spring to Europe, where I'll be gone for quite some time once again, depending on how the Lord leads there. Uh, we're wanting, though, to really take time and come and meet you guys in person as well. So hopefully we're going to find that time where we can do that. Anyway, we love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I'm Stephen Benet. Within an institute of biblical research. Shalom.